you have your Bible, open it up to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians is um, probably one of the most important books in the New Testament for what it does here with certain theologies that we take for granted, but they were having to hash out. They, didn't ha- they needed someone to, to, to throw some light on it, and Paul was more than willing to do that. He had never been... He had never met these Christians in the city of Colossae. Uh, They were uh, led to the Lord by one of uh, his mentees, one of the people that he had spent some time and poured himself into and had followed him around and seen the the things that God was doing. And and great things were happening. And uh, their love was sincere to the point that it was uh, known by so many people around them. They were a city that was uh, very close to uh, Laodicea, a very big city, but they were a very small city. But they were on a very important trade route. So they had an ability to minister to those who were traveling. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't have Holiday Inn like we have, and they didn't have all of those uh, special restaurants on the side of the road and all that. So people, when they were coming through, and literally the overflow from Laodicea, would overflow into the small city of Colossae. And they had an ability to meet new people all the time, as well as to minister to those people that they saw every day. And and that tells us something about what we should do as Christians. There are people that we're going to know for years, decades, but, but we continue to minister to love and to help, to aid, to do something for them to uh, bring them along, hopefully to make their life a little bit better and to uh, share the goodness of God with them. But there's others. We're meeting new people all the time. And we're getting to know new people. At least we should be open to getting to know new people. I think one of the tragedies about the society that we live in now is we've become so fast-paced, but it's become smaller. Uh, The groups that we hang around with are smaller than they've ever been. We, we say that we get to know them more, but I'm not really sure that we do. Uh, and I think that's all of us. Uh, how many of you can say that you have so many acquaintances, but probably not the ones that you really can pour into and become active, continual friends with? Even neighbors. For, for generations and generations, people knew their neighbors, helped their neighbors, could be called upon or to, could call upon them, but yet in our society today, we don't really have that much of that. How many of you know all your neighbors? See, that's, uh, it, and, and part of that is just society because we're a more transient society than we've ever been before. I said all that to say this, there were some things that needed to be fundamentally stated Rumors travel faster than truth every day of the week. And people go, amen, brother, and people go after that, that which is uh, the bad news that people think is the good news. They'll go after that quicker than anything. And isn't it funny that, that you have to tell the truth ten times, you tell a lie one time, and the lie will be remembered and the truth will not be. And how many of you have ever been in that game where uh, like 10 kids would be in a little circle and you'd whisper something to one person and by the time it went around to everybody and it got back to you, I mean, you may say, you know, um, uh, this ball is round. And by the time it got back to you, it's Elvis is a good singer, right? (laughs) Something like that. And that's the way uh, things can be so easily mistrued and, 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 uh, doubt can come in, and, and well, I thought this would happen. No, I thought this was what it was, and that's what we see happening here. Now, Colossians 1, so very, very important. It's taken me four times on Wednesday night to get through 11 verses. I have, I have traveled slow. I'm going to pick up the speed a little bit tonight, but not really much, Okay. Because there's some things tonight, and I I do want to say this. There's some things that you may take as a given. They didn't understand it that way. And there's some things that you may, a truth that you may become become very familiar with. But let's, let's look at it tonight. 
with fresh eyes because I want us to see all the truth. Have you ever studied something and saw something and you said, you know, I never saw that before or I never knew that. Somebody was teaching and you say, well, I've never heard anybody say that before. We want the whole counsel of God. That's why you're here tonight, right? That's why we open this word of truth up every day is because we know that, that, that we, may, we may know some of this, but we don't know all of this. And most definitely, all of this does not have all of us. So we, we come to approach it every day. So I just want to look at this. We're going to walk through it slowly. And, and if you've got a question, raise your hand. I might not call on you, but, but raise your hand anyway. I think you're, I think you're saying amen or something like that. All right. We're, we're going to begin in verse 9, though I'm not going to talk until we get to verse number 12. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Praise God that there are people that pray for us like Paul prayed for them. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. I pray that this for us. I want us to know God's will. I want us to know that will every day. And all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I want to know the fullness of it. And I want to have a, a, not just an understanding, but, but the spiritual aspect of it that God may be wanting to do in my life. That you may walk worthy of the Lord. Isn't that what we're all seeking to do? And he says, fully pleasing. I want to please God. I want to please you. I want to, I want to be faithful in, in all things, in every aspect of my life. I, I want to have a life that is, is true all the time, being fully pleasing, fruitful in every good work. Anybody want to be fruitful in every good work? Come on, Wednesday night crowd. You want to be fruitful in everything that you touch? I mean, isn't that a wonderful goal? Strengthen with all might. Verse number 11. According to his, his glorious power for all patience and all long suffering with joy. Then verse 12 says, giving thanks to the Father. We just finished a season called Thanksgiving. And uh, I, I think that we need to be we need to have gratitude for each other and grateful for the things that we have. But I'm going to share this with you. I, 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 I was taking my walk today. I'm, I'm going back. I'm trying to do my walks again. And, and I was taking my walk, and I, I found three pennies. And y'all know what I do when I find a penny. If I see that it's heads up, I give God praise. At that moment, so I pick it up, not because I'm a Baptist preacher, but because I, I want, well, maybe because I'm a Baptist preacher. I don't know. Maybe I'm that stingy, but I, I, I pick it up, and if it, I begin to immediately praise God right then. I don't wait two minutes. I don't, I don't say, hey, I begin to praise God. If I find that it's tails up, that means heads down, and I begin to, to seek to be humble in my life right then. So when I was taking my walk, the very first thing that I found was I found a penny that was heads up, and I just began to praise God. As I continue my walk, I found another penny, and guess what? It was heads down. It was tails up. So I began to say, Lord, help me be humble. And I began to think about all the things that God, that I was just praising, all the things that he had done for me, all the things that I had from his hand, amen? And that's a lot. That's a whole lot. I mean, I'm clothed, I'm, I'm filled, I'm not hungry, I'm warm, I, I have a place to go. I have people who give me grace and love me. I mean, I've got, I've got a, an opportunity. My job is to pour myself into God's Word and to love God's people. Is that not the best job in the world? I mean, y'all actually pay me to do that. That's a gig right there. And I began to be, be humble before God, and I continued my walk, and guess what? I found a third penny but it was heads up again. So I began by praising him. I, I paused to see that I was small and he was big and, and that I can only be something because he is something. And I began to be humble and then I, I ended it with praising him all over again. We need to have thanks be to God, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. I'm not qualified. And by the way, you may think you're qualified, but you're not either. You have what you have by the goodness and grace of God. If we thought that we were somebody, we, our, our ego would go out the roof. Our pride would go out the roof, and God wouldn't get any glory out of it. 
So be very careful of those people who are very proud of all the things that they say and do. Right? We're only qualified by how, what God has done for us. He says, giving thanks to the Father has qualified us to be partakers. That means I get to be a part of it. Of the inheritance. That means something that is passed down to me. I didn't do anything, but someone had to die so that I could receive. And Jesus did exactly that. Inheritance of the saints in the light. If you're a believer, you're a saint. You're part of God's family. You're a joint heir with Christ. The Father has some things that he wants to pour out for you. And you can have them now. These are for us. This is our inheritance as children of God. That's what we're going to be talking about. But hear those last words, in the light. I didn't inherit darkness. The things that come to me from God are light. The Gnostics that Paul was really trying to work on, they believed that there were many gods. And when they looked at the world, they could see the tragedies and the sinfulness of the world. And they thought to themselves, to be in this world, we're all bad. Now, some may think that they're good, but if they're honest with themselves, if they're listening to their conscience, their conscience, their conscience will tell them that they're not everything, right? So, so to understand and to know that they were thinking that there were so many gods and that they, they considered everything in this world as bad, and they looked at it and they said, how can a perfect God create something that's bad? How can God create evil? We all know that he doesn't. We all know that we chose evil, and God allowed us to have choice. So God didn't make me evil. I have a sinful nature. It's been that way ever since Adam and Eve. So it's been passed down. But by the way, it's carried on from generation to generation because we choose evil. right? So this was their theory. Holy God, but then it, it, it's like God was multiplied because there were so many gods and and got away from the perfect God, and there was a little bit of imperfect and a little bit more imperfect and a little bit more imperfect, and then we get down to the God of earth because it, it had to be a God that was like the people of earth for them to have allow evil to go on. You ever talk to anybody and they, they would ask that question? Why is it that a loving God would allow children to die or cancer to happen or or all these tragedies, or all this terrible stuff to happen. The Gnostics believed that. They said, well, they said, the earth is bad. Matter is bad. The world is evil. So you're not supposed to be like the world, but, but they didn't think that God was all that either. So hold on. Paul's saying, we need to thank God because this God has done something amazing in our life. He has qualified us to, be, be, to, be, to have the inheritance of all of that which is light. Look in verse 13. He has delivered us. The word is rescued. He has rescued us um, from the power of darkness. Is there a power in darkness? You can talk. Does Satan have power? He's, he's got it. He is the prince of the power of the air right now. Not because he overpowered God, but because God is allowing him. Right? I mean, God could put an end to anything he wanted to at any time that he wanted to. God could over-absert his power over any situation, but God allows things to happen like they are. But what about sin? Sin is like a spider's web. Anybody ever got caught in a spider's web? I mean, the whole point of a spider's web is the spider makes the web so the fly can get caught in it and not get out of it. It can hang him there, and then he'll come and he'll pour his stuff over so that it can't get out. Let me give you another illustration. What about quicksand? Never been in it, don't want to, right? But the point of quicksand is you get in it, and, and I'm told the harder you fight to get out of it, what happens? The more you get sunk down into it, and it'll pull you in and pull you in. Sin will pull you in. We talk about 
in my, in my world, when you try to help people where they are, and I, I've run across a lot of addicts and, and I, people down on their luck, people who don't know how to take care of money, people who uh, uh, don't know how to keep a job, they go from one to the next to the next. I, people who do not know how to control their emotions so they blow up every relationship because they just keep throwing this negativity toward it. You know, I, I've been around, my job, I guess, is sinners. Sa sinners and saints. Isn't that good? Isn't that what all of us have to deal with is we deal with sinners and saints? But we, we need to understand here that there is a power of darkness that will take you further down and further down and further down, but there's an equal power, a greater power, that is able to take you from darkness. It's called light. So everything that we saw, the inheritance that we saw in verse 12 that comes from God that is upon, listen to me now, every Christian, every one of us, we're born in light, but we have that light available to us. Now, we're living in a sinful world, and we have sin within us. But there is a power that has delivered us, that has rescued us. Rescued us from the power of darkness. The problem that I have with so many people is they believe that they've been given the power of light, but they are not trying to get away from the power of darkness. They have grown to accept that when God's trying to rescue them from it. I might not be there, but I need to be growing there. What's the strongest part of a tree? Roots. And y'all know that it only goes up when it goes down. And if the roots aren't strong, what's going to happen? And, and the roots don't happen overnight. You know, next month is... People are going to take a lot of, they're going to make a lot of uh, resolutions and they're going to join the, the gymnasium and they're going to go in there and, and, and one day they're going to try to lift everything in that gymnasium, right? And the next day they can't lift a fork, <laughs> right? Instead of, instead of trying to grow it slowly, they try to do the whole thing all at once. The roots under that tree, they don't happen all at once, do they? They grow over time. So I understand that there are things in my life that tend to move towards darkness. There's areas in my life where my mind will tend to drift towards darkness. Now, I know all y'all don't. Y'all don't have that problem, do you? And yet, we're supposed to move every day towards the light. We've been delivered from, if we'll accept. He says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness, has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. The word convey there means has transferred. He has moved us from one to the, to the next. When, when someone is taking one language and they're moving it into a different language, what do they call that? Translate. They're moving it from one where it has one essence to, a, to, to something that, of a different sort. That's what is happening here. We have been conveyed. He, we've been delivered and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son that, of his love that God loves so very, very much. Well, Paul's here. Aren't you grateful that the, that the Father loves the Son? and pours out unto himself in his son. And aren't you grateful that he loves you in the same manner? Now, is he going to listen to, does the father listen to the son? John 5 says, absolutely, you hear me, you hear me. Does the father want to do everything to bless and to honor the son? Now, hold on, you're joint heirs. He looks at you through the blood of Jesus Christ. He looks at you in the exact same way. So does, does God lis listen to you in the exact same way he listens to Jesus? Does God desire good for you in the same exact way that he does Jesus? We have been, we have been delivered out of darkness into, into light. We have been 
translated, transferred from our way to his way. From a way of quicksand to a way of glory hallelujah lane. We're no longer stuck. Come on now. Released. Set free. The word literally could mean liberty. How many of y'all like liberty? You want to live in liberty? Do you want to give up liberty? In this room tonight, we would say no. We would say like Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me... Right. I don't want to not have liberty. I, I'd rather die than not have liberty. But yet, every day when we're choosing between light and darkness, we forget that we've been rescued and delivered and we, we move back. Come on. Sometimes we go back to places that we've already defeated once to, to face a defeated foe. And why is that? Because we loved darkness rather than light. Rather than light. Verse 14. In whom, that is in, in Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. This word redemption. How many of y'all have ever heard that word before? Don't we use that word a lot? But we forget the depth of the meaning of that word redemption. The word redemption means to be released. If you've ever been in jail, your best day in jail was the last day when they came and put the key in that door and opened the door and said, you are released. Amen? But here, let me give you a better picture. Y'all want a better picture? One that you can hold to? Your brain remembers pictures. Let's say somebody was kidnapped and was held hostage. But someone comes, here's the word, and paid the ransom. And when they paid the ransom, the person was released, was set free. I was in hostage to sin. I was held by it. I was in the jail cell of doom, but somebody came and paid my ransom and took, and, and took every chain off me, praise God, took everything that was holding me down and holding me back and released me from that, delivered me from that. And set me free, set before me a path of liberty and light and good choices. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now the Old Testament, they looked at an animal that would have to give his life so the blood could be shed. Some animal would have to die so their sin could be covered for a temporary time. Or they had a scapegoat, and they would put their hands on them, and they would put the sins of Israel on the scapegoat and take it out in the wilderness and set it free so that it would be lost. So the sins would be on the scapegoat so that they could be freed. But we don't have the blood of a goat. We don't have the blood of an animal that died for us. We've got Christ who gave himself. I mean, it was no big deal for the priest to say, give me the lamb, I'll slay the lamb so that the blood of the lamb. But Jesus said, I'll come, I'll be the lamb, right? I'll allow myself to be slayed so that my blood will pay the ransom for these dirty, rotten, sinful prone to wander, lovers of darkness, so that I can change them, translate them into the glories of his light. The people of Colossae need to hear, needed to hear that. But I, hear, I want to tell you, the people of the United States of America need to hear that. They need to know that, that the, inside them, that conscience is ticking and telling them that they're a failure, that they're broken, 
that they have no hope. They need to know that someone has already taken care of it. They need to know that there is light and love and joy and peace and goodness. But in our world today, they would rather stay in the quicksand of sin than to have to do anything of themselves to move out of that. They don't want to give up the darkness, but folks, darkness and light cannot coexist. You've got to repent of darkness before you can ever receive the light. I said I was going to go fast. I don't know if I'm going fast or not. Sorry about this. That in whom we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now hear, hear what he's saying in verse 15, 16, and 17 when he's talking to that group of people who thinks that there's many gods. He is the image of the invisible. Let me stop there. If there's an image, then it's not invisible. Come on. If you can see it, then it's not invisible. So there's an image. But I hadn't seen him. But he has been seen, felt, and heard. We're talking about God that we couldn't see because we couldn't take his glory. Not this side of glory, not this side of heaven. So when you want to see God, look at the image of Jesus. If you want to see goodness, then look at Jesus. If you want to see love, look at Jesus. Well, I wonder what I should do in this situation. What would Jesus do? WWJD. What would he do? Well, I know he would be kind. I know he would be forgiving. Well, what are we supposed to be? Come on. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what patience is, look at Jesus. He is the picture. And by the way, he has been seen. Can you imagine those people that were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, were yelling at the Son of God? He was God. And they were doing it, they thought, in defense of God. They thought what he was doing was blasphemy, but who was doing the blaspheming? That's right. So when you want to talk about, people want to talk about, well, where's God? Nobody's ever seen him. Well, I've never personally seen Jesus. Read 1 Corinthians 15. There was a lot of people who saw the resurrected Christ. I mean, I have been told, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an advocate in a, in, a, in a court case, but I've been told that you can look at the things that happened when Jesus was resurrected and by all the people and how it stood the test of time that nobody came in and said, oh, no, no, that didn't happen. It, there were people, even Paul, when he was writing this, he said, and there are a lot that are still alive today. If you want to go look at, go talk to them. We have eyewitness accounts. And by the way, this thing has stood up for a long period of time. And it's had a lot of enemies trying to poke holes in it. And they haven't poked one yet. It's the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. It is always reliable. You can count on it every time. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn, I love this, over all creation. You know what he's saying? He is the creator and because he's the creator, nothing created him. So the way that they tell, say that is he is the firstborn, or he was actually the uncreated one who's the author of creation. Y'all like that? I think that's pretty self-explanatory there. The firstborn over all creation. For by him, for by Jesus, here's a word you're going to see twice. All things were created. You're also going to see that same phrase in verse 16. All things were created. Let's just pause here and talk about that word all. Y'all remember what all means? All means all and that's all all means. Right? So is there anything that he didn't create? Well, hold on. He, crea he, 
For by him all things were created that are in heaven. Look up. I don't mean it me. Past the Milky Way. Right? This, this Milky Way that has a tree and stars that we only talk about eight. Right? But, but a tree and stars and, and a tree and galaxies beyond that. He's got them all. He's got them all. He created all the heavens, but he also created the earth. Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. That means he holds all of heaven. He holds all of earth. Visible and invisible. How much of this earth do you not see? I don't know. I was born in 62. Um, I'm a young whippersnapper to some people. I mowed his dirt to others. But I wonder what it was like when they came up with the theory of the atom and when they actually talked about splitting the atom. Was there any evidence that occurred when they split the atom? Somebody yell boom. Come on. That's right. Nobody had ever seen it, but there was a there was effect. Now, there's a lot of things that you and I don't see, but that doesn't mean they're not real. Y'all ever heard the stories that I don't see electricity, but I'm not going to sit in the dark until I do? Right? We see the effects of it. How many of y'all see gravity? I don't see it, but does that not mean that it's not there? Try, try, get up on top of the house and say, I suspend gravity and jump. Don't get mad at me because I can't visit you in the hospital, amen? That's where you'll be. He says, look, he is, he is the author of all creation in heaven, earth, visible, invisible. Now he goes deeper here. He says, I don't care whether it's thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now, let me give you a, a different way of looking at this. There are thrones, we talked about earlier, Lucifer is the prince of the power of the air. He has a throne. He has power. It's temporary. Revelations 5, that, that book, the title deed for earth, he's going to come back and take it back. He's going to take, take ownership again. He's going to come back. Jesus is going to put his two feet on this earth, and he's going, Satan's power is going to be over. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have power now. That does not mean that there are not Evil in high places. I had a church member one time, they say, Preacher, you over spiritualize everything. And I tell you, well, I said, I just believe that there's a whole lot going on because the Bible says there's a whole lot going on. And you need to trust that there's a whole lot going on. And you, you, you're trying to say that, that uh, you got control over this, but I'm telling you, you don't have near as much control as you think you do. He was a scientific kind of guy. By the way, uh, he got cancer later on, and he found out that there was a whole lot more powers than he knew about. And he began to pray about things that he thought I was being silly over praying about. You know, I guess it's all perspective, amen? He says, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. But can I tell you, there are thrones, there are dominions there are principalities and there are powers but greater is he that is in me than all those other things i am not god but the spirit of god lives in me i have created nothing but the creator lives within me i got a pea brain but the author lives within me. 
We need to quit bad-mouthing the work, the handiwork of God. Because he is over all of these things. When you think that, that things are out of control, I'm here to tell you, listen to me, I'm going to say it again. When you think things are out of control, when you think that, that bad is going to win, I'm telling you, it's not going to win. God's over it. All things were created through him and for him. For you? No. I'm the benefactor of his grace. But they were created by him, and they are sustained by him. You can't take another breath without him. You can't, without the ability that God gives you to think, you can't make your way out that door. You'd be laying on the floor babbling, not knowing how to do anything, if it were not for the very grace of God. Now listen, he created all. He sustains all. We have the inheritance of all. We have the living Christ within us that is greater than anything in this world, no matter what we face. And he is not only the creator, he is the sustainer. So I don't have to worry about those things if the sustainer can do it. I'm not going to die one second before he wants me to. So I can just yield it to him. All things work, to, work together for good. I may not see the good, but that does not mean that God can't make good out of it. I'm going to say one last thing. Remember, about three weeks ago when we were looking at this, it was saying that we would have all knowledge and spiritual understanding. The word knowledge means to experientially know. To know because you've experienced it. There's some things that we know here, but we haven't, we don't know them in our heart and in our life yet. There's some things that we say that we believe that we're not living out yet. But we're putting down roots. We're growing every day. And the more that we get stronger being rooted and grounded in him, the larger he can make the tree and the more he can make the fruit of it. By the way, the beauty is in the fruit, not in the roots. But for us, the roots are essential. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your goodness. Oh God, when I say those words, we thank you for your goodness, our words cannot describe how very grateful we are for all the things seen and unseen the strength and the power that is greater than any other power. And we know there are many powers of darkness. But thank you, Lord, that you have paid our ransom and we have been released. We have been set free. We have been delivered. We have been rescued from those things. And, Lord, that you are working in, with, and through us. And, Lord, we just want to praise you because you're the author of all creation and nothing can happen, not even the next beat of my heart, unless, Lord, you order it and sustain it. So, Father, may we live like Christians that you made us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.